All right, thank you for having me back again. It's good to be here. Now, I've, um, I've had quite a weird week, so I'll just get that off my chest first if that's all right, all right? So, six, about six, so our family, we, we, for holidays, we like going on cruises, right? I, I know cruises aren't for everyone, but we love it. They suit us really well. So six months ago, they announced cruises are back, all right? They've been gone for two years. We've really missed them. Cruises are back. So I get on, I look for one, I book one, I book one. So, and the, I booked it for last week. And uh, the only thing I could get was uh, four. I could get four people in a cabin. Now, the wife's working that week, so I think, okay, I'll take me and three of the kids. We'll just go on a short, nice cruise. That'll be great. Regular, all great, all right? So it's all set. Two months ago, the cruise company contacts me and they say, oh, look, we've, we've rejigged the schedule. Uh, you're now on a different boat. So if you want to keep the booking, you can, but great news, you get $200 credit to spend on the boat. I think, what a deal. Yes, I'll take it. Then they say, oh, by the way, it's now a themed cruise. The theme is Elvis Presley. <laughs> I think, all right, well, I'm not really into the king. I mean, the guy died the same year I was born, right? And I don't think the kids even know who he is, but whatever, I'm locked in, I'm $200 ahead, I'll take it. Well, now that I've come back, I can tell you that $200 was nowhere near enough compensation <laughs> for the amount of Elvis that I had to endure. So normally on cruises, there's a, every cruise has a big theatre. And they have these shows every night. And they're, they're surprisingly good. Like, they're much better than you think they'd be. And normally there's, there's variety. You get comedy and musicals and magicians and hypnotists and all this. Night one on the schedule is a band with an Elvis impersonator. I think, okay, that's not really for me, but we'll, so we'll give that one a miss. Night two, same band, different Elvis impersonator. <laughs> all right? Night three, they switch it up, different band third Elvis impersonator. Fourth day, there's one called Gospel Show. Gospel Show. I think, geez, this is more my speed, isn't it? <laughs> gospel Show. It turns that we, so we go, me and the three kids, we go to the Gospel Show. Turns out the Gospel Show is one and a half hours of churning through not one, not six, but eight Elvis impersonators all in a row. Eight. Eight, e oh, by the way, did you know there's a technical term for an Elvis impersonator? They're called ETAs, Elvis Tribute Act. It's a technical term. <laughs> so, so, we, so the kids have to endure one and a half hours of, of this. I see on the schedule as well, because cruises, they give you a thing each day where you've got a schedule, right? And I see there's a thing uh, in the middle of the day called mindful colouring. You know this thing that adults do, right? We're adults. We'll do some colouring in. And I think, man, I am elvis out here. I, I, I'm, this is not normally my thing, but hey, I'm going to give it a go. I go along. There's five options to, to, to draw. Guess what they all are? <laughs> <laughs> They're literally pictures of Elvis. I think, all right, all right. I'll go up, I'll go up the top deck. I'll sit by the pool. I'll relax. That's what cruising is all about. That's what it's all about. I go up. I sit by the... There's a giant screen there. They got Elvis movies on a loop, on a loop. Before this week, I had never seen an Elvis movie. I've now accidentally seen six. <laughs> all right, so all of that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today, except that is the context in which I had to prepare this message, <laughs> with Elvis smashed into my head. All right. Oh, I feel better having got that off. Thank you. All right. So, today we're talking about God's church needs you. So, there are a few things, or there's probably lots of things, that pastors and preachers, they probably don't want to talk about, especially if you're the senior pastor. Maybe, and, and I think two of the main things are things like um, giving and serving. So, asking, asking people for their money and asking people for their time. So... Uh, Adrian did not put me up for this, but I'm going to take the hit today and I'm going to talk about serving, okay? So, serving, and by serving, I mean, uh, I mean it as a whole package, like as in serving and being engaged and being 
uh, act, being an active member of the church. Um, it's, or as the Bible puts it, as we'll see, essentially bringing your gifts and talents that you have been given by God to benefit the whole. So you bring what you've got, we all benefit, it's better for everybody. All right. So, recently, if you have been following worldwide church news, there have been quite a few controversies in mega churches lately. Has, has anyone noticed this trend? I mean, it's absolutely everywhere. So, there's a podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill that is, that, well, not only Christians, but everybody's listening to it. Um, apparently, there's three uh, churches, three mega churches in New Zealand that are going through various turmoil and leadership crises and there's obviously a local one as well that um you know we all we all know about so i i'm quite interested in how all this is playing out because we were in a mega church for 20 years for 20 years and we're very deep in there my wife tracy she worked she worked there for uh 10 about 10 years on and off um and so yeah we were heavily involved i mean we were sort of, we were there for so long and came up through the youth that basically the, the people who we were in youth with ended up being like in leadership positions. So we basically knew everyone and everyone that was going on. So now I don't have all the answers or anything for, and there's, there's so much to all that. And I mean, the, the podcast Rise and Fall of Mars Hill is great. If you can, if you can get onto that one, it's very, it's quite fair and quite comprehensive. Um, and there are lots and lots of lessons for churches um, to take out of that. And a lot of the coverage in the, in the media of that sort of thing is kind of unfair in, in that it will target, uh, like, Christianity generally, like, things that could be targeted at any church, like when churches take positions on moral things or have uh, standards and that sort of thing that maybe the world doesn't share. Um, however... Uh, for our purposes today, there was one thing that I would consistently see through all these reports and something that I think we, even uh, a church like us, can look at and do a bit better. So here's, here's a quote. This is from one of the New Zealand ones. Um, and this was, uh, like I say, this was common. This was in all of them. Um, so it goes like this. This was, this was what one, one person's reflection. Quote, some days I would be up as early as 5 a.m. and wouldn't get home until past midnight. We had to attend every meeting relevant to our ministry area and other general meetings, set up venues, pack down venues, integrate new people into the church, serve on our teams, attend church twice on Sunday and know the status of the spiritual wellness of each individual in our life group, which included multiple catch-ups within the week without being paid for any of it. So, now, from my time and observations this was generally like because all these all the mega churches have a college attached to them so it was generally college students who were getting chewed up in this way however even normal even normal people you know just like me or even uh, my wife as a staff a lot was expected of you so as as a church that they did they did expect a lot from you especially around um big events or conference times and that sort of things. It'd be long days, and it was just the normal. It was the normal. It was the expectation. Uh, and but after all, we were all in it together. And it, you know, in some ways, it's kind of it's kind of fun to all be in it and um, you know pushing pushing for a cause and that sort of thing. And in the end, it's it's all we're all doing it for God's glory, and it's a privilege to be there. And th that is true. That is true as far as it goes. Um, we are doing it all for God's glory and it's a privilege. However, not surprised one bit that there was a lot of burnout, right? And, and that, like, that's, that's an extreme example, um, but it, it certainly did happen. So, years ago, five years ago, uh, we, we move on from our mega church. I arrive, we arrive here at Restore Church, we find the complete opposite. Absolutely nothing was asked of us. Uh, the expert, the, we were used to uh, the the schedule uh, as a bare minimum on Sundays. You uh, th th not here like where we were before. You serve one one week. Uh, you, uh, sorry, on a day, on one day, you serve at one service. You attend another service. On on 
uh, during the week, you attend a connect, right? You attend a connect group. On the next week, you go to, like, the, the connect groups are all in tiers. So you, go, you, you run one one week and you attend one the next, right? And then um, anything else that's on in your demographic, right? You, the, you, kind of just, you kind of just go to it. Like, if, you, if you're youth, you're at youth. If you're... Uh, uh, if you're a, a bit older, you go to the bit older. You go, whatever, whatever's on, <laughs> whatever's on, you go to it. If it's in your demographic, um, and uh, the, yeah, and then there was other bits and pieces. There was leaders' nights. There was uh, the staff even had to go to heaps of stuff. So I turn up here at Restore, right? I've been here a few weeks. I t- uh, all I did, I turn up on a Sunday. At the end of the at the end of the service, people say, "Oh, bye, Brad. See you next week." I think, well, what? Where's all the extra? What, what, what else am I supposed to do? Uh, and someone said to me, oh, by the way, join a connect group if you, if you feel like it. I thought, oh, my goodness, uh, this is so easy. So, um, yeah, so there you go. There's, there's, two, there's two contrasting uh, situations. So, the, you've got people being burned out or you've just got uh, no expectation at all. Um, and so, I think, uh, hopefully... By the end of today, we find a nice happy middle. We can find a nice happy middle we can hit there. So our philosophy here, um, it is, we, of course, if you're part of the church, we definitely ask that you you get involved, that you be engaged. Um, Because, as we'll see shortly, everybody, everybody has something, something unique and something they've been gifted with and something that they can bring. And without that, it's not the same and it's not as good and we all don't get as much done as we could, or, or if you're not doing your bit, others have got to carry that load. And so, uh, you know, not in a pressure way or anything, but it just, well, as we'll see, that God has, a, God has a setup and he has a system for it, and when it's running smoothly, well, everything runs smoothly. Okay, so, yes, however, we always want it to be sustainable. We are in this for the long term. We're not looking, uh, no, uh, we don't ever want anybody to be chewed up and spat out. Uh, We love you. We're in it for the long term. There are enough pressures in our life without um, church being uh, a burden or a pressure on you. It should be a relief to come here. It should should be like an oasis in in your life. Uh, not a burden, not something where you're under pressure, things are expected on you, and we're just wringing everything out of you we can. All right, so, now we've kind of talked in recent weeks, or th- there is a bit of, a, uh, so post, post um, uh, pandemic, post shutdowns, lockdowns, churches closed and all that sort of thing, there is a general trend towards people being feeling a little bit disconnected from their church which is quite understandable we've had a reasonable break and there are a few reasons so look I'll just go through a couple of the reasons that I think why why people uh, these days are a little bit disconnected so firstly there's the fast there's the fast burnout that we mentioned earlier where you where you get you, you come in you do everything and uh, you're expected to do everything, and you just but you just flame out. You flame out too quickly, right? Secondly, there's a slow burnout. So sometimes over decades, maybe like uh, over half a uh, half a lifetime, a whole lifetime of turning up, serving in church, maybe it becomes a bit of a grind, right? You're there all the time, um, so that that can be a factor as well. Um, there is the uh, as a as a more of a overall factor. There is there, there has been to some extent a general loss of trust in the church as an institution. Like it's not like it was in my grandparents' day, where the church was there and it was reliable and you knew what you were going to get each week. It's uh, the, you know scandals. Uh, the mega church collapses, like like we like we mentioned earlier. Like even the even the big boys seem to be faltering at the moment. The ones where you would think, well, they'll they'll hold it up even if the little guys aren't you know aren't pulling their weight. Um, here's one that I experienced in the last two years. Right, so we didn't we didn't actually have to come to church. It was dead easy to be to come to church in the last few years. Right, 
All you had to do was sit on your lounge in your pyjamas and press, press go on the YouTube machine, right? It was so easy. So I think a lot of people, a lot of Christians, right, and uh, this is even me, we got a little glimpse at what having free time on a Sunday looks like. Like, Sunday, I haven't had a Sunday morning to myself for 30 years, 30 years. I've just turned up to church every week because that's what I did. But suddenly I got a look and thought, oh, this is kind of nice, isn't it? You can actually decide what you want to do. Um, so I think there's a bit of that. And um, yeah, so watching church from home, it's, it, nothing's asked of you. It's dead easy. So it was, it was quite easy to get disengaged there and to maybe feel like it's, it's um, more of like a product that we're just consuming like any other, any other video. Um, and then as we have been, as we've been touching on the last, say, month or so here in church, there's also a bit of general, general trauma around from the last, the last few years. We've all, we've all been through quite a lot and different people to different degrees. So um, that is definitely causing people to be cautious as well, to, to dive back into things and commit themselves fully. All right, so, however, having said all of that, Times do change, but one thing doesn't change, and that's God's Word. And luckily for us, there is an entire chapter in 1 Corinthians about this very subject. So, let's fire it up here. So, 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, Now, concerning spiritual... uh, I've chopped it up a little bit. Um, I've kind of, I've, yeah, I've, I, I promise I haven't made a mess of it or anything. It's, it still means what it means, but I have chopped it up a little bit. So, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Uh, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. Uh, therefore, I want you to... Uh, uh, okay, let's start at verse 4. <laughs> Why don't I put up the whole chapter? <laughs> okay, so, now... There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, right? So that's our key bit. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ, for in one Spirit we're all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, free or slaves, and all were made to drink of one spirit. All right. So there's our key verse, is verse 7. Uh, and it is that each one, everybody, to each one is given a manifestation of the spirit. Everybody has something to offer. Everybody has something to bring. And... Why have you been given it? Have you been given it for, for your own glory? Have you been given it for, to have a, a warm, fuzzy feeling inside? Well, sometimes, like that does come with it, I guess. But what's it for? It's for the common good. It's so that as a body, we can all come together, bring what we've got, and make it the best we can, right? It, it's, it's always funny to me how in any given church, you will generally have people with extremely diverse skills who just happen to have found each other and they bring it together. It's almost like God was putting it all together in his own way and saying, hey, look, you've got this, you've got that, you've got that. If everybody brings it, we can get it done, right? So, that's 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, yeah. So, uh, is there a second bit to that? can't remember what I did there. Yeah, there we go, there we go. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I forgot what I was up to. Okay, so for, um, so for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, I'm not an eye, I don't belong, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So this is all about um, that no part is more important or less important, and we all need each other. We literally can't do it alone, right? On a very, very basic level. If I stood up here to speak, spoke me heart out, but they hadn't pressed the sound button, no one can hear me. No good. Right? Later on, I'm going to say, let's have communion, right? 
there is a, a very unglamorous job of pouring out the communion. And someone does that every week. If they didn't do it, nothing would work. Nothing would work. The big things and the little things all work together. The public and the behind the scenes things. The, the during the service, the before the service, the during the week. It all comes together to make it a whole. So we can never... So there's two sides to this. Is We can never say oh, we don't really need that part, or we don't really need that part. And secondly, um, not, not only do we really, like, we can't say that we don't need it, but it means that whatever part you do, it counts. It counts, even if nobody sees. And you're bringing that part to make the whole better. All right. So, uh, let's go to the next one, because I really like when the, the book of Acts gives us a real example of things that we read about. So, we've got, luckily, we've got a model. And, and, and sometimes it just gives us, sometimes it's like, it's like the book of Acts isn't even meaning to. It's just telling us what happened. And all of a sudden, it's a model for, that we can follow. So, Acts 6, what is happening? So, at the time, the, so this is obviously early in the book of Acts. The church has just exploded and they're basically trying to manage it and work out how it will look from here on. So, at the time, a number of disciples, number of disciples were greatly increasing. A complaint, or a, yeah, actually, so growth, growth is one of the hardest times to manage this sort of thing. Um, I do pray that we do have that problem in the future. That would be really nice. Right? At the time, the number of disciples was greatly increasing. A complaint arose from the Grecian Jews against the Hebrews because of the Grecian widows were being neglected in the daily ministry. The twelve... Okay, so they've, so they've got an issue. There's some area that's not being covered in the life of the church, in the life of the congregation. So the twelve, the leaders, summoned the multitude of the disciples. So they got together, had a meeting and said, it's not appropriate for us to forsake the Word of God and serve tables. They're like, we're busy. We're, this is our job. That's, that's fine. It's not lesser or, or like we're not better, but we're busy. We're busy doing this. So, therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. Then we can appoint those men over this business and we apostles will continue to devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. What a great idea. Let's find some people who can do this, who are into it, who are people we can trust We'll assign them to that, so we can do this, they can do that, everybody will be happy. This proposal pleased the whole multitude. Oh, fantastic. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Philip, the next guy, however you say, how, the next guy, however you say him. <laughs> Timon, some other guy and some other guy. Oh, Nicholas. <laughs> right? The congregation presented these men to the apostles. The apostles had prayed. They laid their hands on the chosen men. What a great system. They saw a need. They found people who were willing to do it. They worked out that they were good people to do it. They said a quick prayer about it and set them on their way. Brilliant. We should do more like that. That sounds easy. All right, let's go to the next one because 1 Peter gives us a very neat summary. And uh, so 1 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians written by Paul... 1 Peter, obviously written by Peter, it's always lovely when Peter and Paul agree, when they're on the same page, because sometimes they don't seem to, like, well, I mean, if you look hard, they do, but uh, sometimes on the surface, they seem to uh, be on different pages. However, in this one, they are not. So, Peter says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift... Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. There you go, exactly the same thing. You have a gift, what are you going to use it for? To serve one another as good stewards of God's varied, varied grace. Varied grace, what's that all about? What's that all about? Are there different kind of gifts given in different portions? I think there are. So, let's go back, can we go back to 1 Corinthians? So... Oh, not Acts, 1 Corinthians. Um, yes. So, I chopped, I chopped 1 Corinthians into four portions and went, you know, if there's 1, 2, 3, 4, I went 1, 3 and 2, 4 because they sort of fit together better. Um, I guess Paul's editor was, uh, <laughs> was on strike. 
All right, so, uh, okay, so th- here, he literally lists a number of gifts. Now, they're all, they're all quite spiritual gifts, um, but we'll get the idea. So, we got, uh, okay, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. Uh, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols. Okay, Jesus is a curse. Okay, now, verse 4. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Oh, no, wait. Different, different Corinthians we need. Different Corinthians. Is, have, I got a, have I got another one? <laughs> Sorry, gang. <laughs> got confused. Hang on, I got it here if... Uh... Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Very good. Sorry. <laughs> okay. For the one is given through... Okay, so remember, um, Peter used the phrase, varied... Uh, var- what did he use? Varied grace. Varied grace. Okay. For the one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, knowledge, according to the same Spirit. Another, faith. Another, gifts of healing. Another, miracles, prophecy... Uh, another ability to distinguish kinds of tongues, interpretation, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each individually as He wills, all right? Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it, and God is appointed in the church at first. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helping, helping, I think that one should be top of the list, because Quite frankly, most of us aren't apostles, right? Most of us can do helping. Administrating, yep, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? No, they do not. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a more excellent, and I will show you a more excellent way. Now, what's the more excellent way? All right, Christians who've been around for, what's 1 Corinthians 13? I'll give you a clue. It's read at every second wedding I've ever been to. All right, it's love. It's the love chapter. So, what, what is the more excellent way and what under, underlies all of this is love. Love for one another and love for God. So, all right. So, we've got, we've got a, a, a variety of gifts here. Now, I'm definitely not going to go into what all of these are particularly. I'm absolutely not touching tongues or interpretations of tongues. Um, so, but the point is, these are all empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each individually as He wills. So, whatever you've got, whatever you're good at, or whatever you can do, that's because God has given it to you, and He might not have given it to me or someone else. He's given it to you because He wants you to bring it. He wants you to bring it to the church. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, so I'm not going to go into what all these various gifts are because yes some of them are hard and um that's a whole not that's a whole nother thing uh except to say that ones like um uh prophecy knowledge and that sort of thing um those are difficult ones and they're controversial and i've seen them used and abused many times and they generally Generally, I will say that I think that they work better, um, things like that. Not necessarily from the stage, because it does become a bit of a show. Um, now, of course, it can, it can, and, and has been done quite successfully. But um, ones like that, they do, yeah, they do tend to get a bit, a bit much sometimes. And I think it's best done. Like if you if you think if you are into prophecy. Um, uh, tongues, etc., knowledge, that's all great, that's fantastic, it is definitely, I mean, it's obviously a gift, it's listed, it's, it's literally in a list here, um, but I, from what, what I've seen, it's generally best done one-on-one or in little groups and with humility, because uh, often, I, I mean, I, I'm talking about like pretty big events here, but when it's done from the stage, it can be a bit, you know, it's, it, it can be a bit of a show. Um, so, but anyway, that's just an aside. We're not even talking about that today. Okay, so, um, right, you're thinking, Brad, this all sounds great. What a wonderful system. What do I do? What am I good at? All right, so I'll give you a couple of really easy ways to figure out what you might do or what you might be able, how you might be able to bring things. Okay, here is hint number one. 
what are you good at? Right? What, what are you good at? What, what are your particular strengths? Number two, what things do you like doing? What, what things do you do that are essentially work but, or effort, but it's no, it's no worries to you? If you can find that, then it, you, can, you can do it, no, no problem at all. Uh, and thirdly, what do other people tell you you're good at? If other people are telling you you're good at, hey, you're likely to be very good at it. Oh, and by the way, if there's something you think you're good at, but no one's ever told you you're good at, all right, there's a bit of a hint, maybe, <laughs> maybe rethink it, okay? <laughs> right? So, I, you know, I want everyone to be honest with themselves, okay? All right, so um, this, this is from, uh, we had a, um, an event for new people a few uh, weeks ago, and this, this was just, uh, this was one that kind of grabbed me on the day, and it's just a, a very simple, brief summary of um, our, our general philosophy here in particular. And um, this is just to do with serving, is what are we going to do? Is number one, what are we gifted at and called to do? That's, that's ideal, right? If, if, you can, if you can hit that mark, then great. Second, simply, what needs to be doing? What needs, what needs doing? And third, what no one wants to do? I don't know what that is. I guess that's like clean the toilets or whatever. I don't know. But that's kind of our general philosophy here is uh, if, you, if you can find something in there, ideally number one, but sometimes, hey, all of us have just got to pitch in and do number two or three because they simply need to be done. All right? So, okay. All right, here's another way to figure out what you might be able to do. If you go home from church or you think about church during the week and something really annoys you, all right, you think something really annoys you, you think, man, they really should have this or they really should have that or why don't they run this event or why don't they run that program or well, why don't you run that program, <laughs> <All right? laughs> It's for you. That's you. It's, you're supposed to be initiating that or investigating it or getting in contact with, the, with somebody or do, do something, do some initiative. If you're complaining, get on it, all right? And here is an exercise for everybody after church today or next Sunday. When you walk in from the car park, from parking your car to when you leave, you, you got to look around and you got to say, what can I do? What, what looks good? What can I help with? I, or you, maybe you see uh, something already happening and you think, oh, I reckon I could do that. That'd be kind of fun. Like maybe I'd like to, oh, look, they, the, they go off to the kids or the, the coffee or whatever. And you think to yourself, that's easy. I could do that. I reckon I'd be great. All right. Now, let's get really, really practical. Um, I'm going to take a minute to literally list some of the things that go on in churches generally and here in particular. This is, uh, this is not rocket science. This is not brilliant. It's just literally listing. And here is what I hope will happen is something, some of these things, because I'm going to give a few that happen in the background that nobody ever even knows or sees. And hopefully, maybe one will just spark a little something and you'll think, oh yeah, I could do that. Or uh, yeah, that, that sounds good. I'd, I'd like to get involved in that. All right, so here we go. First things first, here is the main and uh, essential thing that you can do in church life is turn up every Sunday, right? <laughs> unless, if you, unless you've got something on or you're unwell or you're on holidays, whatever, then turn up. It's heaps better when you're here, right? It stacks better. Um, now, ministry areas. There's obvious ones. Are you good at music or singing? Are you, do you like hanging out with kids, right? Go and be in the kids' ministry. There's very practical things. The grass needs mowing. The gardens need gardening. Youth. If you've got a heart for the youth ministry, I'm sure there's something they can do you can do to help out there. Sound and camera. Um, sound and camera. I mean, it it's, it's requires some skills, but if you're into it, I reckon they'll show you. Is it, it's hard, is it hard? Is it hard, gang? Oh, they're kind of like, yeah, yeah, but no. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Because I don't want to demean their job, do I? I don't want to say, well, it's dead easy. It's easy. Anyone can do it. <laughs> uh, Okay, 
You can say hi. Do you have a voice and can say hi to people? Well, you can do that at the front door. It's not that hard, is it? Or is it, Bert? Is it challenging? (laughs) We've got the coffee thing here. Um, The more the merrier at the coffee thing. Um, They'll they'll show you how to do it. Uh, Apparently, that is hard. Like, it takes a bit of practice. <laughs> is that true? Yeah we, yeah, oh yeah, we do have very high standards, so it'll be a while before you're let on the real thing. You'll probably get have to, you'll probably do a few trials, all right? Um, like I said before, tiny things like communion, it doesn't appear all by itself. Someone's out there doing the little squeezy thing into the cups, all right? Are you able to squeeze small portions of liquid into cups? <laughs> okay. Connect groups. There's, we got connect groups all through the week. Join one, run one, whatever. If that's if if that's what you want to do. Um, sometimes we have pop-up ones that go for a limited time. Maybe you've got an idea for that, or you want to host one, or something like that. I mean, I'm just tossing out. None, none of these are definites or whatever. I'm just tossing out general ideas. Um, sometimes there are things that aren't. They aren't really formal ones. Then you're not on a team. Maybe you are super good at being encouraging or you're really good at hospitality, like you're really good at having people over or, you know, welcome, whatever, whatever. Do all that sort of thing. Um, maybe your thing is, you know, you go out to lunch or you invite people over for dinner, stuff like that. Now, there are loads of admin things that you wouldn't even think exist. Like r- just today, Susan is running this thing called Safe Churches, which is this admin thing that has to happen or that we, we do to be re, like to fulfill our responsibilities and to make sure that we're um, you know we, we have a system to look after um, the safety of children and all that sort of thing and it's it's a heck of a process right there's a lot of admin to it and you've got to do interviews and all this sort of thing and but Susan it's her thing so she's doing it and it's really it's really helpful because it, it saves it's it's quite a particular skill. And it's not one you would normally think a church, it's not an obvious one in a church. Like, obvious ones in church are like, you know, preaching or singing or whatever. But that, that's a, that is something we absolutely need done. And it's way better if the, the staff and that can do the, their job instead of having to do that sort of thing. So it's great. Um, safety audits. But there's literally like a safety audit. I think uh, Reese, it was Reese who did it. And he gave us this massive list of things that needed to be fixed. Now, that is, that is not a glamorous job or anything one you think of, but he's good at it. So he decided, yeah, I'm going to do that. There are loads of compliance things we've got to do all the time. Sometimes reviewing documents. So we've got a, we've got a membership thing going here, and we're reviewing it at the moment. And there's this long document. And us elders, we cannot be bothered reading it. It's ridiculously long, right? So... So maybe you want to read it for us and make some notes and give a summary so that, so that much like in Acts, people can do, and, and maybe you like that sort of thing. Maybe you are a detail person, right? Because not everyone is. And maybe you are, I don't know, like a, not that exactly, but things like that. <laughs> okay. Um, th- like physical things around the building, things need repairing. Maybe you don't repair them. Maybe you go and get a quote or something and, and say, hey, you know, it costs X number of dollars to fix this and, you know, what, what, could we consider that? That sort of thing. Look, I don't know. Or, or, or You've got to figure it out for yourself. But, uh, oh, and also there's stuff like um, accounting stuff. Like, uh, I, I don't know if we're even announcing this yet, but we'll probably need a new treasurer soon. Like, we, we, we're going to need, um, you know, people to look after the finances and stuff. Maybe that is your thing. Okay. So, anyway, there's a few ideas. All right. Now, having said all this, there is two principles that I want to leave you with. And because, like I said earlier, we want to find a nice, neat middle between the excesses and almost uh, almost like abuse that um, you can sometimes fall into uh, in church life where you're just used up um, and the... Um, kind of frankly minimalist approach that we sometimes sometimes have here because you know we 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 absolutely don't want to tip into the other area all right so I'm going to give you two stories with two principles okay 
First one is about skiing, right? I really like skiing. I'm quite good at it. I've been doing it since I was five. But now in real life, I'm quite a nice, placid, calm person. At the snow, I have a reputation for being a real jerk, right? So, but I think it's justified and this is why, okay? So, uh, over my many decades of skiing, I've taken many new people. I've taken uh, many new people because I like introducing it. It, it. It's great. The more ski buddies, the better. So, I'll take a new person, all right? You take them to the top of the hill and you give them something easy. You say, okay, let's go sideways. They go sideways, like they're all wobbly. They go sideways for one metre. They fall over, okay? That's how it goes. You always fall over. Then you give them something a little bit more. You give them, you know, your couple of metres, and they do it. They Inevitably, they fall over again. So after a while, they've fallen over five or ten times, all right? Then they're starting to get a bit confident. It, it's, all, it's the same pattern every time. I've seen this dozens of times and been through it myself. So after a while, you're getting much more confident, and you're starting to think, hey, maybe I can do this. So here's what they'll do. You'll say, okay turn your skis a little bit more down the hill so you can get a little bit more pace. And if you get in trouble, just turn up the hill. You can only go so far up the hill and you'll come to a stop. Here is what happens every time. They go, they turn down the hill, they completely lose control, right? And they're flying down. They're not flying down the hill. They're flying sideways on the hill, but with no control. Eventually, their skis will wobble, go up virtually in the air, and they'll crash, right? It doesn't hurt, really. It's snow, right? It's soft. It doesn't hurt, but it is a bit of, it's always a bit of a shock to fall over, okay? So, now, this is a key moment in any skier learning to ski, and I know this because I've seen it many times. So, I will immediately ski over to... And, and what I see is they'll fall, and it's the biggest fall they've had. Like I said, it doesn't hurt, but it's shocking. And what they'll do is they'll just lie there. And maybe that one of their skis has fallen off. They'll just lie on the ground, right? Feeling a bit sorry for themselves. Here is what I will do. I will race over there as quickly as I can. I will grab their ski, put it back where it needs to go. And I'll say to them, get up and get back on your ski, <laughs> right? And they will lie there and they'll be, because they're feeling quite comfortable down there, right? <laughs> because snow, <laughs> snow's kind of soft. They've taken a hit. And they're like, oh my goodness, this is like the 11th time I've fallen over. I know I probably should get up, but hey, this is great down here, <laughs> right? So, but I, I am firm with them. If they don't get up, I will say to them, hey, get up and get your skis back on, right? Because, and, and if they don't, the third time, depending on my pre-existing relationship with them, I will yell at them, get up and get your skis on. Why am I doing this? Because I know something that they don't, right? What is snow made of? What's it made of? Water. It's made of water. So if you're lying down in the snow, you may well feel quite comfortable, and you may be lying there feeling sorry for yourself, thinking, wow, this is way better than being up and falling over. But what is happening? The snow is water. It's getting into your clothes, right? You don't feel it at first, but it's getting into your clothes. And once it gets in, it doesn't come out for the rest of the day. And I know that if you lie there for too long, you are going to be cold and miserable it, within an hour, and you will probably give up halfway through the day because you're hating it. So that is why, I, do, do, am I justified in yelling at, yelling at people? Because... You know, I've had to repair a lot of friendships and family relationships. <laughs> but I only wanted what was best for them. So I will say, get up and get back, get your skis back on. So, <laughs> are you seeing my analogy here? If you, I want you to get up because I, I don't want you lying there and getting miserable and quitting. I want you to be in it for the long term. I want you to be my ski buddy. I want us, by the end of the day, by the end of the next day, to be going on adventures and challenges together. So, 
I totally get that people have been through a lot or they've burned out for various reasons or they're not engaged for whatever reason. But I want you to be honest with yourself because lying in the snow is not doing anyone any good. So get up and get your skis back on. <laughs> All right. Having said that, the second principle is... I'll give you another story, okay? So... We are vegetarians in my house, so we have tremendous amounts of fruits and vegetables. And years ago, I realised that a thing exists called Paddy's Market at Flemington. And at, pa at Paddy's Market in Flemington, I heard, you can get huge boxes of fruit and vegetables for super cheap. Like, it's, uh, it's literally the markets, and it's, it's where the, the, all the fruit and vegetable shops get it all each day. But on Fridays and Saturdays, it's open to the public. So, I thought, yes, how good is this? I'm going to go there, get, get boxes and boxes, and, and bring them back. That'll be great. So, I go there. Um, so, I'm there to save money. I'm there to save money. I'm there to get huge amounts of fruits and vegetables. Um, everything's in boxes. I walk in there, it's enormous, it's, and it's an absolute riot. Like, there's people yelling all the time. There's people yelling the price. They're like, you know, oranges, $5, $5, $5. It's, it's, it's riotous. It's giant, too. It's, it's as big as a Bunnings, and there's just pallets of stuff all over the place. It's crazy. So, there is a... Um, so, it's boxes, right? So, people have got various ways of carrying them. Some people have got a carry trolley. Some people just carry them, whatever. There is a trolley service... Um, but the, it, there's a hiring cost. You've got to pay seven bucks to hire a trolley. I looked at the trolley hire. I thought, I am running on very thin margins here. I'm here to save money. There is no way I'm contributing seven bucks to the trolley mafia over here, okay? <laughs> this is a racket, right? So I'm like, no way. I'm carrying them, okay? So it's just me. It's just me. So... So I go, so I walk around the markets. I get myself a box of oranges. I carry it. It's feeling good. Okay? I go, I get, uh, I get a bag of potatoes. Right? I say to the potato guy, put them on top of the oranges. It'll be right. It'll be right. Oh, you got to park. By the way, you, the parking's a riot as well. It's crazy. You, you park about 100 metres away. And, um, all right. So I'm carrying, the, I'm carrying the potatoes. I'm carrying them. It's it's okay, I can handle it, all right? Then, I get, well, I get something else. I might, get, I might see a tray of peaches. I think, geez, that's good value, isn't it? Ten bucks for a, tray, a whole tray. Got, got to get it. You'd be silly not to, all right? So, I get it. Now, I'm carrying three things. I think, okay, that's it. I've got I to I take a trip back to the car, okay? I start my trip back to the car. I walk past the avocado guy. He's got a whole tray, 15 bucks. Like, okay, I've got to get in on this, got to get in. So, I somehow managed to manoeuvre $15 out of my pocket. The avocado guy is like, do you want to come back for him? I'm like, no, I'm good, I'm good. Load, him, load me up, load me up. So, I'm now carrying four boxes, four boxes of fruit and vegetable. I've got 100 metres to go, okay? I'm feeling strong. I'm feeling powerful at this point and I'm, I'm ready to go. Away I go. I get 25 metres in, I think, oh, what have I done? Arms are, starting to, arms are starting to burn, right? I get 50 metres there, I'm done, I'm cooked, right? I've got to look for somewhere to put this down. I've got to find a bench or a table. And I, every time I find it, I finally find it, I stand there and I say to myself, Brad, you have bitten off more than you can chew, right? Then I, I summon some more strength, I go again, I go again, I barely make it to the car, I, I dump them in the boot and I'm done. I go back to the markets because four boxes is not enough. I need more. I need more. And the bargains, I'm, I'm lured by the bargains. I'm loving it. So back I go. I load up again, right? Same pattern. This time I think, well, that was too much. I'm just going to go with three now. I go with three, but my arms have already taken a load, so they can't handle it. I go back again. I get halfway. Same thing. I say to myself, Brad, you've bitten off more than you can chew. All right? It took me three months before I gave in and finally got a trolley. All right? <laughs> I thought, oh, seven bucks. It's ridiculous. So... 
there, so the principle here, do not bite off more than you can chew. I would say that to myself every single time. And I got to the point where I'm thinking it. I would have four in my arms, I'd think, okay, I've bitten off more than I can chew, but it's different this time, it's different, it's different. <laughs> it was never different, all right? So do not bite off more than you can chew. Um, we want, we absolutely do not want anyone burning out here or not having a good time in church life. You definitely need to get back on your skis, but please do it in a sustainable way. Now, I want you to be honest with yourself, because I don't know what, I don't know your life situation necessarily. You might have a lot going on or whatever. I only commit to what you can actually do because we want you here for the long haul. So let's make sure we're not doing nothing, but we're also not doing everything. There is a very nice, happy, sustainable middle in here. Maybe you start, I don't know, you sign up for something once a month or something. That's, tw that's 12 times a year. Come on, anyone can handle that. Don't bite off more than you can chew. All right, in summary, we've all had experiences in our church life. Well, we've seen church life from the inside and the outside, and it's been good and bad. God has a, has a way, He has a system, and it still works, no matter, what's, no matter what's going on with us or what's going on in the world. We all, all of us, we all need what God has given you. So please, do us all a favour and work out what you can bring to make this whole thing a bit better for everyone. Because, like skiing, it's the more the merrier. The, the bigger your group, the more fun you're going to have, and together it'll be so much better and we'll get so much more done. So if you are lying down in the snow, you're getting wet. Get back up, get back on your skis, and don't bite off more than you can chew.